Hello, family, and welcome to episode 313 of Stand Up Daily. I am Pete Dominic. Joining me today, MSNBC anchor, the great Ali Velshi, and Fordham University professor, Dr. Christina Greer. I am Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Stand up. Yeah, that is the great John Carroll, who wrote and performed this song for this show. One of many hundreds, over 800 amazing paying subscribers of the stand-up community. So many more of you listening to the show on a regular basis. We'd love to have you join us, be a part of our community, which is doing good things for the world and for each other. We will hang tonight at 8 p.m. because it is Thursday. And on Thursday nights, the stand-up community is all invited to a virtual hangout. And that will continue when things open back up and return to normal. They were born, it was born out of the desire of mine and so many of you to connect with folks and meet new people even in a time where we couldn't really leave our homes. And I've loved it so much. So many of you have as well. Usually anywhere from 40 to 80 folks join up on Thursdays at 8, 8 Eastern. And I'm looking forward to doing it tonight with you to see you. Got an awesome, two great conversations on today's show. Very excited that Ali Velshi and I have maintained a friendship over these years because I'm really impressed with the work he's doing. I think he's doing the best work he has done in his career. And I tell him that right there at the top of our conversation. That is coming up. And as always, a brilliant conversation with Dr. Chrissy Greer. Both of those coming up. But first, we've got to look back at the last 24 hours in news. I always do that at the top of every show right here to encourage your friends and family folk to listen to a podcast that's daily that gives the best recap on news and then goes in-depth on all of the issues that matter to you, your family, your community, your country, and your planet. We talk about it all. If it's important and consequential, if you're looking for solutions and ideas and ways to stand up, and if you're looking to be part of a great community, you don't have to be, but if you want to, you can always just hang and listen to the show. Appreciate that. But, well, this is the place. You found it. So welcome to it. And let's get to the last 24 hours in news. It's the last 24. Okay, much to discuss. Let's start with the fact that the number of people who have received at least one dose of the vaccine in the United States of America is 73.7%. Sorry, 73.7 million people have been vaccinated. It's 60.5% of the prioritized population, as it's referred to. 22.2% of the total population. Have you gotten vaccinated yet? Who in your life has? I haven't even really looked into it. I I don't know when I'm supposed to sign up or where. I'm really not been very prepared because I guess uh, it just I didn't think it was my turn yet. But I probably should look into that. If uh, if you have, tell me what to do, because apparently I can't do it myself. All right, let's just go through a couple of quick headlines. The EPA administrator has been sworn in by Vice President Kamala Harris. His name is Michael Regan, and uh, we can talk more about him in the future. Speaking of Kamala Harris, though, a, a man from Texas was arrested outside of the official residence of the vice presidency. Maybe he was looking for Mike Pence. Yeah, yeah. No, it was uh, It's not nothing funny about this. this is the U.S. Naval Observatory, and on Wednesday... Uh, a Texas man was arrested. He was in possession of an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, 113 rounds of unregistered ammunition, and five 30-round magazines, according to a D.C. police report. This is a serious and terrifying news story, as there were plenty of those uh, in the last 24 hours, including the fact that the House approved legislation to award congressional gold medals to the Capitol Police and other law enforcement agencies that protected the Capitol during the January 6th insurrection. The vote in the House was 413 to 12. Yeah, that's right. 12 congressmen and women voted against congressional gold medals for police who protected them, protected them on January 6th. Guess what? All 12 were Republicans. And to add more outrage, going back, staying at the House of Representatives, the House also voted to renew the Violence Against Women Act, 244 to 172. That's right, 172 House Republicans voted against renewing 
the Violence Against Women Act. I should probably get one of them on and ask them why. And just so horrific that they voted against the Violence Against Women Act on a day when eight women, was it, were they all women? Maybe it was one was a man, were all shot and killed because they were women. Let's, I mean, not beat around the bush. Do we have to speculate about that? Asian women are fetishized, sexualized, and marginalized and are uniquely vulnerable to violence. And on a day when we witnessed that, the House Republicans voted against renewing the Violence Against Women Act. Hmm. Let's dig into that at some point. Postal Service found no evidence of mail ballot fraud in a Pennsylvania case that had been cited by so many top Republicans. Important story to get into, but just the headline for now. Also, the IRS pushed filing deadlines to May 17th as they are grappling with a huge backlog of returns. Now it's time to get to some sound bites, some audio here in the last 24, and let's start with the horror story from Atlanta, Georgia, where a white gunman was charged yesterday with killing eight people at three Atlanta area massage parlors in an attack that sent terror through the Asian American community, which has increasingly been targeted during the coronavirus pandemic, reading from the Associated Press story. A day after the shootings, investigators were trying to unravel what might have compelled a 21-year-old white man to commit the worst mass killing in the U.S. in almost two years. Here is what President Joe Biden had to say when he was asked about it in a pool spray after he met with, I think, the Irish prime minister yesterday. The question of motivation is still to be determined. But whatever the motivation here, I know that Asian Americans are in very, uh, very concern because, as you know, I've been speaking about the brutality against Asian Americans uh, for the last couple months, and I think it's uh, it is very, very troubling. We also heard from a woman who is part Asian herself. The Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, weighed in on it. I do want to say to our Asian American community that we stand with you and understand how this has frightened and shocked and outraged um, all people. But knowing the the increasing level of hate crime against our Asian American um, brothers and sisters, we also want to speak out in um, solidarity with them and, and acknowledge that none of us should ever be silent in the face of any form of hate. And to add a controversy to a horrible, horrible massacre, the the Cherokee County Sheriff, a guy named Captain Jay Baker, he was talking to reporters yesterday, and he said that the suspect had had a really bad day. And so that went crazy on social media. A really bad day? And that, quote, this is what he did. Also, later on, uh, folks found a Facebook page of Captain Jay Baker where he had actually promoted, this is a, the police officer in charge here, a t-shirt with racist language about China and the coronavirus last year. Uh, suddenly that Facebook page was deleted and Captain Jay Baker not immediately responding to voicemails from reporters. Uh, and maybe it's because he said this yesterday and it wasn't really received very well. He claims that these, and as the chief said, we know this is still early, but he does claim that it was not racially motivated. He apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex fiction, and sees these locations as something that allows him to, uh, to, um, to go to these places, and, and it's a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. When I, when we, I spoke with investigators, they interviewed him this morning, and I, uh, they got that impression that, yes, he, he understood um, the gravity of it, and he was pretty much fed up and then kind of at the end of his rope and uh and yesterday was a really bad day for him and this is what he did oh wow oh what a terribly bad take captain jay what a terribly bad take and here's why my friend katie fang is an msnbc legal contributor happens to be a korean american awesome woman very smart here's what she had to say about why that's so foobar I think it was responsible for the press conference that the sheriff's office did today to basically promote a narrative that could potentially be false. I mean, justice may be blind, but that doesn't mean she's stupid. And so when you put out into a potential jury pool that this shooter says that this was not racially motivated, but then you hear that the shooter's own family turned him in. Have we heard whether or not the shooter's family is going to corroborate that this was not a racially motivated crime? The cops have to do an investigation, Joy. They need to look at his social media history, his organization alliances and affiliations. 
allegations. But ultimately, the cops have charged him with eight counts of murder for the eight counts of the, the poor victims in this case. But then the state attorney's office or the district attorney's office is going to look at the evidence as well. But that doesn't preclude the sheriff's office from actually saying that these were hate crimes, that these were racially motivated, and that these were the result of the killer in this case wanting to target intentionally Asian victims. I mean, Joy, this was not a random indiscriminate crime. This man got in his car and he went to these locations to target Asian women. And I saw it was so again, I think it was irresponsible for law enforcement to kind of put into public consumption today the idea that this guy has a sex addiction and he had a bad day. I think that dehumanizes our victims and it makes it problematic for a prosecution later on if a jury pool thinks, you know what, these were just sex workers. We haven't heard that either. And so to kind of affiliate right. it right now, I think from a prosecution standpoint, is really a bad idea. All right. The great Katie Fang dropping legal knowledge on us on MSNBC with Joy Reid on the readout. And here is Congresswoman Judy Chu of the 27th District of California. She's the first Chinese American congresswoman ever to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. And she told Chris Hayes, gave him a little bit of context about where a lot of this new anti-Asian hatred has come from. Uh well, we first saw it in January when the coronavirus uh, was making its appearance. But when Donald Trump started calling it the China virus and the Wuhan virus, uh, contrary to the advice of CDC and the World Health Organization, who said to call it COVID-19 because calling it otherwise uh, would only cause a stigma for those of different ethnicities and from different countries, Donald Trump actually doubled down. He actually said it even more and had his Republican followers use those terms even more. Hence, what it caused was even more fear and terror in the Asian American community. So we kept on hearing about stories after stories of people who were the victims of taunts and uh, racial epithets um, of people like uh, the family of three in the Sands Club in Texas where a man stabbed all three of them, two being children ages two and six, and afterwards said it's because he wanted to kill Asian Americans due to the coronavirus. So this is happening all over. In my district, there was a Chinese American man who was attacked with his own cane at a bus stop in Rosemead, causing him to lose part of his finger. So yes, it is happening everywhere, including in my district. Congresswoman Judy Chu on MSNBC. Now let's head over to CNN, where we heard from my old friend Lisa Ling, who's a contributor at CNN. And some people might question whether or not uh, Asian women were being targeted here. And there's still a lot of details that remain. But here is Lisa Ling's take with Aaron Burnett on CNN last night. I think they were out front, out front. Were targeted Asian women, period. These were Asian massage parlors. I mean... Lisa, if this were any other minority group that were targeted in a shooting spree, would there be this hesitancy? Well, that's the question that we're all asking. I mean, Aaron, when you think about it, if this were a synagogue or a black church, there wouldn't be a question. This terrorist targeted three Asian massage parlors and asking the assailant whether this was racially motivated and taking his word for it just seems like a joke to me. I mean, we know that this is definitely a hate crime against women that we know. And by the way, as you said, this just this happened days after a 75 year old Pak Ho, uh, an elderly man in the Bay Area, was was brutally attacked. And, 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 And and as you mentioned, there have been numerous attacks even since then. Lisa Lang. I love Lisa Lang. We always got along really well. She's great. When she would join me at Sirius XM, I should reach out to her and Katie, who's been on the show many times. Uh, both awesome. And batting cleanup on this segment, trying to give you context on this horrible massacre that happened at these uh, Asian massage parlors in Atlanta, is the great Brittany Cooper, who is a professor at Rutgers University. And she's the one who mentions toxic masculinity and men and patriarchy, because, of course, this has to be addressed. We have to talk about it. It's always men that are committing this kind of gun violence. Here she is. 
One of the challenges we have is that we don't speak intersectionally enough. So we always think that because this is a, a white supremacist crime, it is also a gender crime. It is a patriarchy crime. And it has to do with the way that white men in particular think that their own particular challenges should become adjudicated through public violence. We see that over and over again. And it's not just about whiteness. It's also about a particular brand of violent masculinity, which, which also reached heightened levels during the Trump administration. This is a man who made it into the presidency after we learned about specific acts of gender violence that he committed and bragged about. But we had already seen it in the country over and over again with white men getting angry and often they would kill their girlfriends and then they would go out and commit mass acts of violence against other people. This time we see these things being combined, but we have to be calling out patriarchy too because as many Asian American professors, activists, thinkers, and the general public have said, this is also about a particular sexualization of Asian American yes. women that is, is, is part of a violent fantasy that we're seeing be, be played out here, too. And it's a problem. Oh, I love me some Brittany Cooper, Professor Crunk on Twitter. She's fantastic. Got to get her back on the show, too. Just talking to myself out loud. OK, and I actually found one more clip that I think was relevant. I wanted to share with you, and it's White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying there's no question that the Trump administration's rhetoric on coronavirus pandemic elevated threats against Asian Americans in the White House press briefing when asked by a reporter. Why does the president think attacks on Asian Americans are increasing in this country? You know, I, I think there's no question that uh, some of the damaging rhetoric uh, that we saw uh, during the prior administration, uh, blaming, uh, you know, calling COVID, uh, you know, the Wuhan virus or other things, um, uh, led to, um, you know, um, perceptions of the Asian American community that are inaccurate, unfair, uh, have uh, raised, um, you know, threatening, uh, have, has elevated threats against uh, Asian Americans. And we're seeing that uh, around the country. That's why even before the events of horrific events of last night, he felt it was important to raise this issue, elevate it during his first primetime address, why he signed the executive order uh, early in his presidency, and he will continue to look for ways to elevate and talk about this issue. All right. So there you go. That is uh, as many clips, as much context as I can give you here on the last 24 regarding this horrible massacre uh, out of Atlanta. And now to a couple of other random clips that I wanted to share with you. First, uh, another outraging clip. This is the governor of Florida, who is a dumb bag of meat that I really don't like. His name is Ron DeSantis. And yesterday at a, uh, I guess, a press conference where it was a COVID-19 update and an education announcement, he announced that there was no room in, in Florida classrooms for things like critical race theory. And I'll, I'll play it for you. But just just <laughs> so you understand, it, at least my opinion, this clip from the governor of Florida proves everything that critical race theory teaches and asserts. Here it is. Florida civics curriculum will incorporate foundational concepts with the best materials, and it will expressly exclude unsanctioned narratives like critical race theory and other unsubstantiated theories. Let me be clear, there's no room uh, in our classrooms for things like critical race theory. Teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other is not worth one red cent of taxpayer money. So we will invest in actual, solid, true curriculum, and we will be a leader in the development and, in, and implementation of a world-class civics education. Okay, all I have to say about that is one of my best friends, uh, I really love this man, Andrew Sparr, is the president. He's a teacher, former teacher. He's uh, now running the most important teachers union in Florida, the Florida Education Association. Andrew Sparr is going to join me next week. Early next week, we're going to talk about that and all things Florida education. Really looking forward to that. And finally, one more thing I want to play here on The Last 24, and that is CNN reporter Gary Tuckman, who I love. I worked with Gary. Why do I always have to work in that I know these people and give you my opinion? You, you don't give a shit. I don't know. I think it would be interesting. I think it's interesting. 
to know that uh, this reporter, Gary Tuckman, is a really good guy, understated guy, you know, hard nosed journalist who, uh, like my friend Tom Foreman at CNN, he's been doing it a long time. He's uh, got daughters, as does Tom Foreman. I just think he's a great reporter. And so I'm telling you, and he's a nice guy. He went to an Oklahoma diner and asked people there if they were going to get vaccinated. And this is terrifying and kind of funny and sad and upsetting. But I'm going to play like this whole segment for you uh, and listen to it along with you. It's breakfast time in Boise City, Oklahoma. And I have this question. Does anybody in this restaurant think it's a good idea to take the vaccine? No. Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea. Nothing. Anyone here is a good idea to take the vaccine? Raise your hand if you think it's a good idea. No hands. Cowboy hat, head down. Not one person here thinks it's a good idea? Nope, Gary. Complete quiet. (laughs) Boise City is the county seat of sparsely populated Cimarron County, Oklahoma, where 92% of the voters chose Donald Trump on Election Day. Mm. The highest percentage in a state where all 77 counties went for Trump. What do you think about the vaccine? Are you going to take the vaccine? No, sir. Tell me why. Well, I don't trust the government and I don't trust Biden. Chad and Misty Hughes are husband and wife. Neither of them plan to get the vaccine. Just don't want to. Well, why don't you want to? If you don't mind me asking. Because when I take the flu shot, I usually get the flu, so. Oh, dear. There's no reason to take it. Are you saying you think you'll get COVID by taking the COVID vaccine? Probably. Are you, why are you thinking that? The research doesn't show that at all. It shows that it keeps people safe. That's just my choice. These women are sisters, and they too are doubters. Why are you doubtful? They just started rolling them out. <laughs> Well, yeah, but they, I mean, this has been a worldwide effort. Okay, by great they doctors. claim that the flu can be cured, but still hundreds of thousands of people die from the flu. Well, yes, a lot of people die from the flu, but not nearly as much as COVID. This is a horrible pandemic, and this is like an amazing vaccine. These vaccines have come out. They're saving lives. <laughs> no. I will just di- agree to disagree on this subject, I guess. Oh, okay. dear. I just, I'm just not. I'm just not going to take it. What if President Trump came out and was very robust and said, take the vaccine? I took it, even though I didn't tell anybody about it. It was kind of done secretly, but I think you should take it. He said it a little bit, but he hasn't been robust about it. If he was robust and said, take it, would you? No. Trump's a liberal New Yorker. Why would we listen to him either? Hmm. Did you vote for him? (laughs) He was the best option. No matter where we went, enthusiasm for the vaccine wasn't easy to find despite this front page pronouncement. So this is the Boise City News, your newspaper, and here's an article, COVID vaccines are available in your hospital. They want people to get them. Are you gonna get one? No, sir. How come? Um, I really don't ever get vaccines. We did find a boss in the grocery store though, who gave us a different answer, but with a caveat. Are you going to take the vaccine? I have taken it. And what made you decide to take it? My wife. Ah. Well done, Gary Tuckman, CNN on Anderson Cooper, 360. But I guess, you know what? I All right. Now, in my own defense, I think it is interesting. It's, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on all of the places that you worked. I worked at CNN, Comedy Central, Sirius XM, Fox News, MSNBC, a whole bunch of other media outlets, networks, etc. at CNBC. I could go on and on. And, you know, so... When I know a little bit about these people, I like to say nice things about them. When I don't like them, I usually don't say anything for the record, unless I really don't like them. And then I say a lot of things. Okay, well, that is a recap of all things that happened. All right, not all things. Some things that I picked that I thought were important uh, on St. Patty's Day. I hope you had a good one, by the way. I should have probably mentioned that earlier. And... Now it's time for rapid fire news headlines that aren't politics and aren't COVID related, but they are important or at least interesting. It's time for the news dump. And here with another news dump jingle from the strange, comedic, talented mind of listener Pete Coe. Let's see. I actually haven't heard this one yet. A rotting grizzly bear back is in a hump. He's feasting on your friend in today's news dump. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He's feasting on your friend, Pete. Jeez. I'm so sorry, folks. I, I I didn't know. I just play these. I don't even screen them. OK, that way it's just that that much more authentic. <laughs>
I mean, it's not live. I could always take it out if he said something uh, truly horrible. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. Keep them coming. News dump time. Let's start with the luckiest dog in Indiana, where a police dog found more than 1,200 pounds of marijuana worth as much as $8.5 million during a routine traffic stop. Still no word on how much of the weed that the cops pocketed themselves, but that's one lucky dog. Now let's go to Hollywood. The Hollywood Reporter, that is. Where they're reporting Marvel has revealed, Marvel Comics, the first gay teen Captain America, the character, is going to be named Aaron Fisher and is the first LGBTQ character to pick up Captain America's shield in the comic's 80-year history that we know of. I mean, Steve Rogers might have tangled with a couple of dicks here and there, and we just didn't know about it. You never know. You know, everybody's on the spectrum. Bucky Barnes, come on. Sam Wilson, John Walker, these guys, one of them dabbled. Those are the odds. But this character will be the first out character, I think. I'm just making shit up. I don't know. Aaron Fisher will be his name. And Marvel Comics announced that it will be a limited series called The United States of Captain America and Hit Stores June 2nd. So that's cool. And also, I bet you you comic books really help young people figure out their sexual identity and orientation because they they always the they were always wearing tight clothes and had perfect bodies. I mean, both the men and the women are ridiculously you know perfect bodies, like muscles and and boobs and legs and butts and things and faces that don't even exist. And they were you know perfect. And I read comic books, a lot of comic books growing up, and I can I can definitely tell you I was aroused by ElfQuest. That's right, I said it, ElfQuest aroused me. The drawings of the female elves got my motor running, and that's when I knew that I was elf curious. You know what else uh, ElfQuest was? Uh, I didn't pick up on it at the time, but I figured out later a polyamorous current always underflowing. A lot of of partner swapping. Okay, sorry, I got carried away. Let's move on to Hornet, murder hornets. Oh, yay! Scientists in the U.S. and Canada are opening new fronts in the war against so-called murder hornets as the giant insects begin establishing nests this spring. ABC News reporting the scientists said Wednesday that the battle to prevent the apex predators from establishing a foothold in North America is being fought mostly in Whatcom County, Washington, nearby Fraser Valley of British Columbia, where the hornets have been spotted in recent years. This is not a species we want to tolerate here in the United States, said Sven Eric Spickager, that's how I think he sounds, of the Washington State Department of Agriculture. They eradicated a nest of the Asian giant hornets last year. The Asian giant hornet is not supposed to be here. We may not get them all, but we will get as many as we can. I don't know why uh, this guy just became a candidate. One of the most interesting conversations about how uh, the pandemic has changed things is how it's changed work and how working from home is a great situation for some people. Not everybody, because it might tend to make you work even more. But I thought this was an interesting story to mention regarding this issue. And the Associated Press is saying that apparently Ford Motor Company has told about 30,000 of its employees worldwide who have worked from home that they can continue to do so indefinitely with flexible hours approved by their managers and their schedules are going to become work office hybrids. So they'll commute to work mainly for group meetings and projects best suited for face-to-face interaction. Ford's announcement sent one of the clearest signals to date that the pandemic has hastened the cultural shift in America's work lives by erasing any stigma around remote work and encouraging the adoption of technology that enables it. I think that is an interesting story, so I wanted to mention that one, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that from quite a few more companies that want to save money on real estate and rent and all the other expenses. And I guess this is a political story, so maybe it's not right for the news dump, but it is also a porn story. And apparently, uh, conservative lawmakers in the state of Utah, where there's a lot of Mormons, uh, they're going to try to automatically block porn on phones and tablets in Utah under uh, this new law, which is absolutely insane and impossible and sounds very primitive and medieval. It's also going to help people get a lot more work done in Utah as a result. So maybe it's not all bad. That and it will bring down instances of whacking it in the car 
So, well, I'm starting to change my mind as I work this out. No, I'm not. This is terrible. And it sounds very Saudi Arabian or Mormon. Let's see here. A couple more. The Grammys are the latest award show to see a drastic drop in TV ratings. A man has been caught raising sharks in his basement and swimming pool. Let me click on this and see if it's in Florida. It is in Dutchess County, New York. Oh, near me. Wow. Seven sandbar sharks. Protected species in New York. And I got to see the pictures of this guy's pool. Hey, you guys want to come over and go swimming? There's actual real sharks. Ah, oh, come on. There's no sharks in a pool. No, no. I actually have a bunch of sand sharks in my pool. Dude, you're crazy. Let's get out of here. Actual audio from the guy's house. All right. Well, I'm not going to top that for the news dump. So let's wrap it up now and get to my first guest joining me today. Coming up, I should say, uh, Christina Greer. Dr. Christina Greer joins me. Have a great conversation with her. Two awesome guests and, and interviews today. But first... He is a Canadian-born television journalist. He was the senior economic and business correspondent for, or is, for NBC News. He is now the host of Velshi on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, 8 to 10. And uh, Ali Velshi and I met back in, I don't know, 2010 when we were both working at CNN. And he kind of took me under his wing. He was really welcoming to me, even though I didn't have any of the credentials, credibility, or general pedigree of most of his colleagues. He was kind. He was thoughtful. He was just nice to everybody. And we've been friends ever since. And been meaning to have him back on the show. He's been on with me several times. And, of course, I've been on with him several times over the years. We've done a lot together. But he's doing his best work, in my opinion. And I tell him that. You should watch him on MSNBC. Tape it. It's the best Saturday, Sunday show, in my opinion. The best weekend show there is. He's on Twitter where he's excellent, uh, always at Ali Velshi. And Ali and I sat down around lunchtime on Wednesday afternoon on Zoom. He looked great. He sounded pretty good. A couple little uh, Zoom blips here, but I don't think we lost anything of significance. Shouldn't be too annoying. And we had a great, fun conversation. And as always, I learned a lot from talking with him. So good. Here we go. All right, there he is, Ali Velshi, who I have known for, I think, over 10 years from CNN to Al Jazeera to Purgatory for like a couple months where he grew a beard to MSNBC to so many different iterations and roles. And I'm here to tell you off the top, you are doing your very best work you've ever done. And I am the person who knows because I have the context. And right now, your show on Saturday and Sundays from 8 to 10 a.m. East is the best work you've ever done. Well, thank you, friend. Uh, you and I have known each other for a long time, and you've been a great supporter for a long time. So it means a lot coming to you because you have seen all that work. And and uh, I never looked very good in that beard. So it was a good thing that it was short lived. Oh, yeah. Are there any photos of the beard? I'd like to- uh, no, <laughs> I, I mean, there may be. But uh, like there was no point at which anybody ever said to me, well, wow, that suits you. What an interesting look. Uh, I, I, I guess I just I have no um, angles in my face. So, <laughs> that's, you know, there's nothing to accentuate. I guess I could try well, doing one of those. You're not understanding it. I, I, too, don't really have many angles in my face, but the beard and carving it in a certain way creates uh, angles, sir. You you look great with it. I got to tell you, you look, you look terrific. <laughs> Well, you haven't your look hasn't changed much in the time I've known no. you, but but a lot of your a lot of your work certainly has in, in many different ways. You've covered pretty much everything that can be covered in news and things that are important to people. But what you're doing now on the weekends, the, the reason why I think it's in, in a way your best work is clearly you have a lot of editorial control. But more importantly, you have two hours and mm-hmm. you are really letting it breathe and and yeah. and talking about all these important issues and having longer segments, which has always been my criticism of television. But most importantly, it seems you have a team of producers who are doing a really good job at finding great, great guests at at, at talking. What do you think is different about what you're doing on the weekends now? Well, I got to curate it. Right. So so we have um, uh, we have a, a terrific booking team who can find me the highest profile people, but also the people with no profile who are often uh, the best storytellers, especially in the last year in America, when we're talking about racism and police brutality and uh, struggling through the pandemic and politics and people's uh, polarized political views. Finding regular people is as important as finding princes and politicians and prime ministers. So I've got a great booking team. I've got a great team of writers. Um, we 
we are driven, you know, I, I obviously have, you know, I have a history in economics and business. That's where I come from. But the lens is different today. The lens is social justice and justice and equality. And so when you take that expertise and you combine it with the things that are out there in the zeitgeist, I have a team that is able to capture that. We give them the freedom to write at length. Hmm. Those those introductions that I do are written by people and and they 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 write them at length with with all of the texture necessary. And then we speak to those guests who we have like you at length and let them tell the entire story. If I talk to regular people, you know, I go out on the street, uh, I, I go out into America weekly and I talk to people and we 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 publish and we we put on air their whole thoughts. So it feels more like an important discussion that you would have in your life as opposed to sound bitey TV. So I've got a you're right to recognize I've got a great team behind. Well, yeah, I like the the it's easier to book the higher profile people. You know them. You know that they're going to talk. Yeah. It's also yeah, easier first people. For, they're trying to get on your show. Right. And it's also easier for you and I to book people who we've talked to before because we know they're great. We know they're great on their issues. Yeah. We know they're great at communicating. But it's really hard to, pro- the, to book the no profile people. And, and, and you guys. It's also there could be 10 people who are struggling, who are passionate. Specifically, you did a segment uh, year year. I almost said anniversary, but commemorating a year of covid. And you talked to a lot of first uh, essential workers, uh, healthcare yep. workers, nurses and doctors and so on there. Let's say you talked you, you found 10 of them. Well, they all feel a similar way, let's say, but they're not all great at explaining it the way it needs right. to be explained on TV. Your, your producers just find these like people who are no, really they, they, uh, good at articulating the things they all feel, but others might not be as good at talking yep. about to you on TV. It's it's very. No, one of my producers said they're going to make you cry. I said I don't cry. Like it's not, I, I'm not given to crying. I don't cry from things I see on TV. I cried four times in that while I was recording that interview. Then I cried again when I watched it back on TV. Oh. Because these are the stories, right? When we're talking about frontline workers, we're talking about COVID, talking about people who lost people. Talk about people who are getting this fourteen hundred dollar check in this in this uh, this recession. When you ask people what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck, what you find out is it's way more expensive to live paycheck to paycheck than it is for the rest of us, right? Because the rest of us can buy things in big quantities. We can go to Costco. You can buy 48 rolls of toilet paper. Um, you know, you, you've got money for the parking meter, so you don't get the ticket. It's remarkable to hear the lived experiences of people. And I think TV has got to figure out a way, or media in general, has got to figure out a way to marry the philosophical and political conversations we have with the lived experience of people. In a way, missing that is what we've done wrong for so many years. That's why we've alienated so many people. That's why people don't like the media because they do believe we're elites who went to the same schools, who talk about the same stuff, who talk about poverty and politics in abstraction, as opposed to their lived experience. It is much more fulfilling to have real conversations with people about their actual experiences, but it is harder to figure that out for TV. So that's what my team does really well. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that y- you and, and this team should win awards for the, the, the actual journalism you're Thank doing, you, because sir. what you just explained that you're doing is so vital and crucial. It's always great. And you do this, too. We hear from the experts and then we hear from the people who these policies, who these these things are are, are affecting. And you, let's let's dig into some of what you guys have been doing on Velshi, because you've you've covered it all. I mean, you have covered Everything from the American Rescue Plan to violence against Asian Americans to the threat to our democracy and voting to uh, you even did a quick segment, but an important segment and something that wasn't on my radar about what happened in Arkansas uh, when they overturned uh, laws about women's reproductive health and basically, you know, no pathway to abortion. You had a great guest on there. So lots to talk about with you. But let's talk about one year of covid and what has changed in terms of the vaccines are now you know millions of people getting vaccinated a day but what do you think was most important that you look back on that you covered in in the past year because you looked at it from pretty much every angle yeah i i have two takeaways as we get further and further away from a year ago Mm. one is it didn't need to be this way if we if we had leadership that took science seriously and didn't politicize it from the beginning, I, I, you know, for all the crazy things that Donald Trump said in the last year, the one that stood out to me was when he didn't want to let people who had infections off of a cruise ship because it would double our numbers. And I think our numbers were like 
10 and it was going to go to 20 or something. That was, it was small numbers. And I thought in that moment, nothing crystallized the, this is entirely the wrong way to think about this than that moment. The, the, we must not be worried about what the impression will be. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I too share that moment as kind of a hallmark of horror. I did a joke about it. I remember doing a joke about it. I said something like, even if his advi- if his advisors came and told him, but sir, Eric and Don Jr., your sons are on that ship. He'd be like, is, is Ivanka? No, sir. Well, then leave him out there. Like, he doesn't yeah, I mean, care about any thing. of those people. He was at the CDC when he said it, which was ironic. It's like, you know that you've got the experts. So the, the, the anti-expertise, anti-science yeah. politicization is the one big thought that I have. The other big thought that I have, which is bigger, is those who came together. The fact that we are all in this together, we may have bad leadership or we may have had bad leadership through it, but we were in it together to see what Americans did for one another, the care that they expressed, the people who kept going to work, the people who exposed themselves to the virus to keep the rest of us moving and and deliver our food or do what we run our ambulances and, and deal with our emergency services and those hospitals. That, to me, even outweighs the first problem. So those are the two biggest takeaways I have about this terrible leadership and amazing unity. And and the unity thing may may nothing worse ever happen to us in our lives as as a community, as a nation, as a world than this. I, I am deeply, deeply grateful and thankful for what humanity is and what it has shown us in the last year. Yeah, I mean, I I. Of course, you're right to, to, to point to that. But it, but we also have seen the divisions based on like mask versus not mask, which has been Weird. so, so hard to try to do. I almost yep. got a fight with a guy the, the other day for the first time in a year. He, he told some woman, corrected him or, you know, said, please put your mask on. And he said, mind your own business. And then I went all Pete Dominic on him. But I mean, like that's that's. Yeah, that has been a very divisive thing. And in a lot of places, people say, don't tell me what to do. What do you make of that? How do we, yeah, how do we I don't by understand that? how that becomes? How does that become a civil liberty issue? First of all, I, I think and I, I, I'm, I'm a big free speech guy and a civil liberty guy. And I think that you do have to practice it and, and you do have to demonstrate where you have it. But the, the cost of the mask, you know, putting that mask, on, it's uncomfortable. I don't love it. But but it, it's so small. Like, why? Why is that going because, to be the well, symbol of your civil liberty? It's not a slippery slope. It's not that if they tell no, you to put a I mask think, on, you're going to lose all your rights. We heard uh, uh, Fauci and others say this. Maybe they said it to you. Uh, but everybody's saying, I don't know what the big deal is. I don't know why they can't just wear a mask. And I have the answer, sir, because it's a perfect wedge issue for right wing commentators. Donald Trump and they used it. They just created a thing out of it. It's because so they made the thing and it's worked. It's got them ratings. It's got them elected. It's got people fired up. But, but if the, if they had if the, the president could have solved this early because these people take their viewership and their cues from him, had he just said, this is easy, let's just do this. But he never did. His experts did around him. They, they, they kind of talked about it. He didn't demonstrate it when he walked around. And I wouldn't have thought that the president was important. Right. I, I'm just one of those people. Most Americans don't think the president has much to do with their lives. The last year has taught me the president has a lot to do with your lives. The killing of these Asian women in, in uh, Atlanta tells me the president and the messages he sends has a lot to do with your lives. You, He does set agendas. And these are the moments in which you can. It seems empty when a president comes out after a shooting or after a tragedy and says the things that you, Pete Dominic, would expect that a president would say, yeah. except when they don't do it. And you realize there are people who take their cues and they're often media people. They're often radio hosts. They're often these people who are looking for any wedge issue. Who the hell made a mask a wedge issue? Well, I, I mean, anybody who thinks that it, it will work to get them what they want, which is ratings. I mean, you also had a great commentary speaking of, you know, this this subject uh, uh, on your show. You had a great commentary about women in the military, and it was a reaction to uh, a right wing anchor on, on Fox News who chose Women's History Month to do this. And he got us all to react to it. I'm fine with him getting us to react to it because I'm always happy to talk about the important role that women play in the military, as well as the threat of sexual assault, which is an epidemic in the military. And you had a great piece of commentary there as well. But that being said, he just did it to to, for ratings. And I I actually I had to think three times before doing that commentary, because on one hand, I was thinking my viewers don't watch that host um, and don't share those views. So am I actually giving it more air? Uh, But I'll tell you what what motivated me. That guy has never spent a day in the military. 
I have never spent a day in the military. How about all we do is we thank those Americans who are prepared to put their lives on the line for us, regardless of their their gender or their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Right. Like my view is it takes a big person to be able to say, I will risk my life for this country and its its constitution and safety. I'm not sure I've got a lot to lecture those folks about. Are there mili- are there problems about how we deploy our militaries and, yeah. and the politicization? of it? Right. Yeah, there's lots of stuff. To, but the men and women who do this stuff are entitled to something other than derision from people like me and him who've yeah. never spent a day in our, of our lives in the military risking our lives for any of this stuff. You know, do you know that I washed out of Navy SEAL training? I, I'm surprised you washed out. I mean, I, I can understand if you left, but I would have figured it was after you had graduated and, and been installed. <laughs> no, I never went anywhere near the military. You're, I, it makes sense. People don't see you because you, <laughs> you, you see you standing up. You're, you're sort of tight. You're, yeah, you're like a V. You look like a kind of guy. You're you're short. Like you you could be a Navy yeah, SEAL. It's They're absolutely all like little tight guys. It's <laughs> little tight. It's absolutely why I say it, because it. Based on how I look, it's believable. But no, never spent a day yeah. near the military. They tried to recruit me, uh, but I wasn't having it. Same thing uh, with the wrestling team in high school. I want to talk with you about uh, another segment that you've done. And I don't feel like it gets nearly enough attention um, in general because it's the interior department. It's public lands. But public lands are yep. super controversial to people who yep. live near, uh, hunt on them in, in states like yep. Wyoming and so many places. Um, you went out and covered this and looked at all sides of this. And I'm really celebrating this week the the uh, the nomination or the confirmation of Congresswoman Deb Holland, who I think is fantastic. Yep. First Native American woman. Big, in Congress. big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So. So first, just first Native American in any cabinet position. Yeah. First Native American woman in Congress and first Native but, American yeah. in any cabinet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and she's great, too. It's 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 not any kind of like uh, uh, they're not filling in a quota. This woman is, is legit. Yeah, awesome. no, she's an impressive, impressive woman. So what do we what did you learn when covering that public land? Well, I really love this topic because not, most people don't think about the, the Department of the Interior. Yep. But in addition to the importance of public lands, the idea of national parks and things like that, which we, we again, we take for granted in America. But if somebody didn't set this land apart, it, it would all be condos like everywhere. Like the idea that countries set land apart to be appreciated or preserved or as monuments is a very big deal that we don't often think about because we have it. That's number one. Number two it is one of the few issues that you can unite the left and the right around because not, not everything about it is, is shared in common, but preservation of land is actually something that is shared in common by conservatives and liberals for different reasons. Yep. Uh, some people like to live is, off the uh, land. They yep. like to hunt on it. They, they all don't want it burned and developed. Let's put it that way. Some people don't like hunting. Some people believe some hunting is necessary, but the bottom line is we all can agree that, Public open lands preserved from development are actually important. That is neither conservative nor liberal. That's what I love about it. And pretty much 140 percent of all treaties signed with Native Americans have been abrogated by the government. That like that's a fact. Mount Rushmore has actually been adjudicated to be land that was stolen from uh, from Native Americans. The difference is that when the Supreme Court ruled in their favor, they uh, set aside an amount of money that the government had to compensate Native Americans for. And Native Americans said, we're not interested in the money. We would like the land back. So the money has been sitting in an account uh, gaining interest. To just look at it fairly, to be able to look at uh, our First Nations people and say, it is one of the original sins of this country, and there are a few, doesn't make America a terrible country, but it is one of the original son- sins. Can we start to get involved in a real dialogue about that? Which my homeland, Canada, did do and and actually signed over very, very large tracts of land uh, back to Native people. Uh, so I think th- that discussion is really important. And having somebody there who at least understands the terms of that discussion is really important. And the third thing is we haven't really heard a lot about the struggles that that Native people in this country suffer, but they do. So Black Lives Matter has at least accelerated some of the discussion around other minorities in this country that continue to suffer. And we are seeing it now amongst Asian Americans. But this discussion about what role Native Americans can play in this country, what more uh, can be done to allow them uh, the things to which they are entitled is an important one. So for a lot of reasons, I'm really excited. I'm so glad that you said that for the past few years, I've been working uh, with with a a tribal, well, the the Fish and Wildlife Agency, my friend Steve Chase, who listens to the show, who has introduced me to all these young tribal people. I do this conference every year. I would love 
to talk with you offline about that and, and, and yeah, get some of those young it. people on your show because they are amazing young people. And what you just said is so true about the attention that they don't get and the struggle that yep. they do have. And and of course, uh, the Canadian issue, which was similar, but but addressed. Yeah, really good points. Uh, I'm so glad you said that. I'm excited to, to, to send some of those folks and their contacts to you. By the way, when I started this last round of, of trips across America that I did, I started in at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, That's I think right. back in October, That's which right. wasn't the wisest thing to do would be in South Dakota in October. But, um, you know, beautiful land, but it tells the story. We, we have to go. We have to go everywhere. I mean, my commitment is I'm going all over America talking to all kinds of people about all kinds of things. But we can't just leave Native people out of the discussion. Yeah. And you're doing a great job at it. And I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, I want to talk with you about what do you call, what do you call it? The American Rescue Plan? The um, the what else is it called? I, I wrote some different names down, but uh, yeah, I call it the relief bill. But yeah, the American Rescue Plan, you know, they 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 they. Uh, they test these names that they do. They, used and, yeah. And, and to see how they work. And by, yeah. by the way, just one quick uh, political question. I've been reading a lot about this. Uh, I'm trying to think of who just wrote this piece, but the idea that there's been, there was so little resistance from Republicans in Congress, especially to this bill. A lot of people are, are, are commenting about that because you and I covered the eight years of Obama, obviously. And, and there was so much controversy about every single thing, and they demagogued it to death until it died often. Yeah, no, this is the opposite. They didn't support it. Republicans didn't support it, but they're, a bunch of them are taking out ads or they're going that's right. telling people how great it's going to be. That's right. I mean, that's weird. I almost wish it were the other way around. It's like, if you don't support it, trash talk it. But but going out, not voting for it, and then telling people about how your constituents are going to benefit from it is kind of wild to me. So, so let, I mean, what one issue that I want to address. I know you interviewed Senator Bernie Sanders. I think it was this weekend on your show. Uh, but I, yeah. I interviewed my dad this weekend. So we're both doing well with guests. Really? And my dad said, you ought to get him on. My dad yeah. said, <laughs> he, he looks like an absolute older version of me. It's eerie. And he said, I don't need that check. That is what you're hearing a lot of Americans say they're doing well. Everybody's getting, some, not everybody's getting something. Most people are getting something, but a lot of people are saying, I don't need that check. Why am I getting that check? What do you say to that? So that's a great argument. I wish we were in a world where those are the discussions we had. What's the, what's the upper limit of income for whether you should get the check? It was about $110,000. Um, and maybe there's a valid argument to be made that maybe it should be 70000 or 80000 or maybe it's 80000 uh, in some places. But if you live in San Francisco or New York, it's 100000 You know, that, that's actually a really good conversation that, that I think reasonable people can have. It's like the minimum wage. I support a $15 minimum wage, but, you know, Mitt Romney put forward a $12 minimum wage. Worth discussing why 12 versus 15. The, the problem is that we are very concerned about this $1,400 check. But really, there are more important parts of this bill, including the three hundred dollars supplement to unemployment that uh, is, is the feds add to the state uh, unemployment rolls, which is good. And then there's this reduction of child poverty uh, effort or, or a reduction in poverty effort about uh, SNAP and, and refundable credits, which means you don't have to file a tax return in order to get a refund on your tax payable. You actually can get a check from the government. Child poverty is so high in this country. It's remarkably high for a developed nation. This will, assuming that Congress renews the provisions in this over time, this could reduce the good cut child poverty by almost half in this country. Child poverty could be cut by almost half. Children do not learn if they are hungry. Children do not learn if they are in high stress environments. So I think your dad might be right. Maybe he doesn't need that check and, and that's okay. I will say that if he, the, if folks take this fourteen hundred dollars, if they don't really need it and they they do spend it in some fashion that stimulates the economy, that's OK, too, because generally speaking, a dollar spent on stimulus by the government returns more than a dollar. Right. The, the way it works and particularly with people on tight incomes, because they're not going to Switzerland on a vacation. Right. They're not putting it into a um, some kind of investment fund overseas. Generally speaking, people who are struggling spend the money in their local community, which generates uh, more economic activity. There's no danger to your dad's point. There's no danger in overstimulating the economy. So let's say we gave your dad a check and he doesn't really need it. Far less harm was done in giving your dad who didn't need a check $1,400 than if we didn't give someone who needed that $1,400 to survive a check. So that's the distinction. You can always slow down an overheating economy. It's called interest rates. You can, you can, you can deal with that. 
you can't goosing a, a stuck economy is very, very hard. So what we learned from the last recession was don't do too little. Do too much and pair it back. Ultimately, you will you will get the same benefit. And if you earn too much money, uh, some of it will be taxed back. So so I, I get your dad's concern. Um, and in a perfect world, we'd figure out what's the right amount of stimulus. How do you treat it differently depending on what circumstance people are in or where they live? But the the other provisions in this bill, and there are dozens, yeah. are really, really important. And they may help us in the long term. What about the argument that... Uh, I don't know if my friend Barry Redholtz came up with this word. He probably didn't because whatever. But inflationistas, inflationistas, he calls them. Yeah. So inflation's funny. We don't think about it a lot. We haven't thought about it for a long time because generally speaking, the concept of inflation is that you've got a limited number of goods and lots of people with lots of money trying to buy those goods. So let's take this microphone because it's so prominent in front of you. Uh, Everybody wants the podcast now that they're home. That uh, microphone, which used to be $250, is now going up to $300 or $350. That's inflation. One of the reasons we don't have inflation these days is because we can make more stuff faster and cheaper than we ever could before because we don't pay terrific wages in America or we get the Chinese to make it or the Bangladeshis or the Filipinos. So we haven't had inflation in real terms for years. Think about TVs, bicycles, things like that. They're actually cheaper than they were 20 years ago. Yeah. But now you put all this money from this bill into the economy. And some people are worried that, wow, this might overstimulate the economy. Like like it might actually heat it up. At which point your interest rates, a mortgage is 3%, 3.5% for a, a, maybe it's 4% for a 30 year fixed mortgage right now. If it goes up to 6%, then we should start to worry about this. We should start to think about it. But these are still historically low numbers. Until we see that inflation, we shouldn't worry about it. Now, the effect it's had is that some people sell their stocks and go into interest-bearing accounts because interest is going up a little bit. And that's uh, roiled the market a little bit. I'll let you know when it's time to worry about inflation. We're not there yet. There are people who say once it starts, you can't catch inflation. That's not necessarily true. They're worried about back in the 80s when inflation was, you know, interest rates were 18 and 19 percent. Mortgages were 13 and 14 percent. Right. We're nowhere close to that. Uh, What do you what about the minimum wage? You wrote a great op ed about it at MSNBC dot com, which I'll include in the show notes. You interviewed, uh, like I said, Bernie Sanders about that. It did not make it into the the rescue bill. What what is the fate of fifteen dollars? The fight for 15. Well, so so seven twenty five is the current national uh, minimum wage. (laughs) Most people think that that's a little ridiculous. There are two states, Wisconsin and Georgia, that actually have about a five dollar and 15 cent minimum wage. But they're governed by the fact that you can't have a minimum wage lower than the federal. And then there are a lot of states that, that share the federal minimum wage. Lots of places are paying a lot more. I mean, Target, Costco, these places have all Walmart have all increased their minimum wage because a they get pressure to do so, and b it, it it becomes hard to find workers at some point. I think we need to look at a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Will costs go up as a result? Yes. Will some jobs be eliminated because some small businesses can't keep? five people on staff. So they'll lower it to four or maybe three. Yes. But a whole bunch of people who work two and three jobs right now, because they're earning seven and a quarter an hour, all of a sudden, when you earn, when you work two jobs at seven and a quarter an hour, and then you get one job at $15 an hour, guess what? You can cut one job out. So the idea that some jobs will be reduced is offset by the fact that everybody doesn't need to work two jobs. So I think it's a huge, important discussion. In my perfect world, conservatives and liberals would be discussing what that minimum wage needs to be and coming to a number that they can all agree on. The conversation is far from dead because even in red states where they elect Republicans across the state, people are voting for measures to increase the minimum wage. So we're getting there one way or the other. Better be in front of the train than behind it. Uh, I could talk to you about economics in general and the rescue bill forever, but there's a few other things I have on my pad that I definitely want to talk with you about. You're headed back to Minneapolis this week, is it? Yeah, end of next week um, when, the, when, when we expect the trial to get started. You were there uh, and, and during the, the protests out there, you were shot by a rubber bullet by uh, from police while you were reporting. Um, and so let me just ask you a broader question about the argument that we have heard from many on the right equivocating the protests, the organized protests in the most part, uh, and some of the violence and vandalism of the protests, the Black Lives Matter related protests from this past summer to what we saw on January 6th at the United States (laughs) Capitol building, uh, where cops were, uh, where a cop was killed and and so many others were injured more. I think more police officers were, were hurt, uh, that day than any day since 9-11, I think I heard. So what about the comparison between the two that you're hearing so many on the right make? 
it, it's it's ridiculous. I, I, I mean, one of them were the, the summer, the, the protests of last summer were born out of people who would like a full realization of their rights under the Constitution of the United States, fair and equal treatment under the law. Very basic stuff. That that is not uh, an excuse for violence, but the 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 underlying reason for those protests were real. We had watched them. We had watched them with George Floyd. We had watched them with Breonna Taylor. We had watched it with Ahmaud Arbery. We have seen the wanton uh, randomness with which Black lives are taken and cheapened in this country. The other one was a lie about the election. I'm sorry that people felt really seriously about the fact that the election was stolen, but it's a lie. It's not a lie that a cop knelt on George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes. It's a lie that the election was stolen. And we owe it to ourselves as citizens of a a democracy to inform ourselves. And, And if you are going to just consume nonsense and then go to the Capitol to storm it on the basis of a lie and perform these anti democratic activities, it's not the same thing. It is not the same thing as a Black Lives Matter march. I, I mean, even Ron Johnson, who talked about the fact that there were 500 Black Lives Matters marches, he's the senator from Wisconsin, uh, that, were, that had violence last year. There were probably 3,000 demonstrations in total, of which in 507, there were violent instances. Even the ones I was at in Minneapolis that first week in which there was a fire behind me at a liquor store, there were five fires around me, the Firefighters couldn't get in. There were no police in the area. Even those were, and I get in trouble for saying this every time because the right wing loves it, they were mostly peaceful demonstrations. In other words, the vast majority of the people at those demonstrations were peaceful and they were demonstrating. Some people set fires to stores, which they shouldn't have been doing. They were looting. They were conducting criminal activity. But that was not what most people were doing. So to characterize this as Minneapolis burning or as Donald Trump used to say in his speeches, like Berlin's worst day, I'm glad he didn't have to be in Berlin on its worst day. Minneapolis on no day. Portland on no day looks like Berlin on its worst day. Violence is not good in any form, but we do have to understand the root causes of January 6th versus last summer are entirely different. Very, very well said. So what are you going to do out there? What's the plan? You're covering the uh, the trial of the police officer and. Yeah. Uh, the the jury selection has already begun, I guess. Uh, yeah. So in theory, and, and this might change, but in theory, they should be done by, with jury selection by the end of next week. And at the beginning of the following week, the trial should actually begin. And this is a an interesting trial because I, how do you find a jury who doesn't have an opinion on this yeah. or hasn't gone into a corner or hasn't seen the video or whatever the case is? It's very hard, even across America. When I was traveling last year, talking to people, I'd have conservatives and liberals and we'd argue about uh the role police have and respect for police and blue lives matter versus black lives matter. Nobody thought the killing of George Floyd was justified. Everybody understood that to be extrajudicial, meaning it is not the role of police to determine the guilt of, or the, uh, the, 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 the fine or the, uh, you know, the, the penalty for a crime. So if you thought that George Floyd, if you believe George Floyd passed a, a fake $20 bill, never gotten to the bottom of that. But if we, if we believe that's the case, great. You should get a ticket for it. He definitely shouldn't be dead for it. So how we are going to adjudicate a case in which everybody has seen the video from many angles and it is there's nothing uncertain about that video is going to be a a big mystery. How that's going to go down uh, is is going to be something we're all going to want to watch very closely. That that is that is the uh, the observation of the carrying out of justice in this in this society. When you were talking about that just now, uh, it made me think about Eric Garner, too, who was killed by police officers in Staten Island. Loose cigarettes. Did you even know that was a crime? I mean, I get it. It's meant to not allow kids to buy cigarettes because kids generally can't pay in New York 15 bucks for a pack of cigarettes, but they might have a little bit of money to buy a few loose cigarettes. I get it. I get why it's a public health imperative not to have that. He's dead because because in theory he was selling loose cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. That's just not none of us believe that's the system. This isn't Game of Thrones, right? We, we don't believe that that's actually what our justice system is supposed to do. And that's the kind of stuff that black people say, that if you devalue their lives, then killing the guy for selling loose cigarettes is not as expensive as killing someone else. Except for Minneapolis, it turned out to be because they paid a twenty seven million dollar settlement, which should make police chiefs and, and others think twice now to say, maybe I'm guilty, maybe I'm not, but I certainly don't have $27 million to spend on on this kind of thing. Yeah, that's why these big lawsuits are important. 
uh, yeah. and, and and police departments around the country. And taxpayers should take a hard look at that when when that's exactly about, right. Uh, taxpayers are voters. So they yeah. need to say, how about we don't have a police department that gets us into twenty seven yeah. million dollar lawsuits? Uh, there's another uh, trial that uh, is uh, heating up, or at least the evidence of it. And you interviewed, I know, at least one person. I saw Joyce Vance was on your show talking about what's happening in Manhattan with uh, uh, Cy Vance's investigation yeah. into Donald Trump. He now has his taxes. Um, and there's a, it reminds me of the uh, Mueller investigation because we're hearing things and we're speculating on what they mean, which is fine. I'm fine with it. But it's, it, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is. But, you know, Michael Cohen has gone in now for like his eighth interview. They've hired yeah. this special lawyer, this white collar lawyer. So these these kind of uh, details that we're hearing being reported, which makes us jump to certain conclusions. Again, I'm fine with it. I think it's an important, super important issue. And at some point, Donald Trump has to. I hope be held responsible for any of the many crimes he's committed throughout his entire life. What do you make of what's happening there? What did you learn? And what do you think uh, we're going to well, see? I, I remind people that Al Capone was never convicted of anything to do with yeah. gangsterism. It was it was yeah. tax stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, there, there I think three important takeaways here. You're right. We shouldn't speculate as to when it's going to happen because nobody knows uh, that's a mugs game. But there are three important things. Uh, the DA in, in Manhattan, Cy Vance, has his tax returns. The, the tax documents are millions of pages long. Um, Michael Cohen has gone in uh, seven times. He's done it by Zoom. Uh, and, and now he's being called in in person, largely because I think they want to show him documents and say, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? They're also leaning on a guy named Alan Weisselberg, who was the accountant. Um, you know, he sort of disappeared from the scene, but he was the guy, he was Trump's father's accountant too. So be interesting to then the money guy, the CFO. So it'll be interesting to see what role he plays. And fundamentally for people who don't follow tax stuff all that well, there are a couple of issues at play here. Donald Trump used the same properties, uh, that he may have understated the value of for, uh, taxes, or he may have overstated the value of for insurance and understated the, the, the value and overstated the value of to get a loan. That's a crime. Like you can't lie to the bank about how much your worth your house is worth to get a mortgage. Generally speaking, guys like you and me can't because they send an appraiser who tells them what it's worth. If you don't agree with it, you can argue with them, but you don't get to tell the house, uh, the bank, what your house is worth. Well, Donald Trump was apparently telling people what his his buildings were worth uh, and getting loans against that. And at the same time, devaluing them for tax purposes. So that's a very big oversimplification of what the case may be. If he ended up defrauding the taxpayers of New York because of that or defrauding insurance companies or, you know, whomever it was or banks, that's uh, an issue that he could face criminal penalties for. Uh, two more big questions for you, and I'll let you get back to whatever you, you do with most of your life, uh, which is far more important. But um, first, the January 6th insurrection. There's some criticism of uh, of media, of of Congress, although I saw Congressman uh, Jason Crow, I think, is that the ex-military guy that uh, played a pretty heroic wor- role that day, helping out his fellow Congress people, uh, uh, trying to pass legislation um, to just uh, remember it, make sure that we don't forget what happened that day. Uh, but the, the criticism is that we have moved on and that certainly Republicans have moved on. How are you seeing it from the standpoint of why accountability and consequences matter? How are you seeing it from a standpoint as producer, editor and anchor of, of your show editorially, I, I should say, in terms of how you look back and, and, and cover it, the investigation of it, et cetera? Yeah. So, you know, moving on is an interesting concept. When in South Africa, after apartheid, they had a truth and reconciliation commission. And the bottom line is, if you came forward and were uh, honest about what you did and what your motivations were, um, that would be the thing that would allow you to move on. If you didn't come forward and and people had evidence on you, the government basically said, we're going to throw the book at you. And if you came forward and lied, uh, you wouldn't. But the concept of reconciliation moving on is based on the fact that Truth has to happen first. And we haven't done that with January 6th. We've got evidence. We had an impeachment trial. We saw a lot of that evidence. More evidence has come out. The FBI continues to investigate. But there's still a fundamental partisan based uh, difference of opinion about what January 6th was. It was an insurrection, a coup attempt based on a lie perpetrated by the former president of the United States and his cronies. Until we share some view of that truth. You can't move on. 
And there are lots of examples around the world where efforts at reconciliation are important and need to happen. But you can't deny what actually happened there, because what stops it from happening again? What chastises Donald Trump and his people from continuing this thing? Because they still do. Donald Trump, he doesn't speak that much these days. But when he does, he still talks about a stolen election and a witch hunt and the lie. So. I think I, I really want reconciliation. I, I, I hate it. I've been out there, as you know, all year. And I I'm so troubled to see how separated we are, how we believe different things and we seem to want different things. I would like reconciliation. But can we admit what happened? Can we own up to what happened? You don't have to take responsibility for it, but you do have to be able to say that's what that was. Call it a coup. Call it an insurrection. Call it uh, something that was based on a lie and be able to distinguish that from Black Lives Matter's. Uh, you know, demonstrations which are not based on a lie, they're based on actual truth that we've seen, then we can move on. And I don't think we're there yet. Uh, final question is about the uh, the health of our democracy, about voter suppression. And you've been covering this really, really well. You've talked to uh, 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 experts on the policy, activists, organizers, Congress people, everybody on every angle of this. But over 40 states and over 250 uh, new laws uh, have been passed since the election because uh, they've used the big lie to say that we need to fix a, a, a problem that doesn't exist, which has always irked me because as conservatives, if you care about uh, government efficiency, then you don't want to spend money uh, creating rules and regulations and voter IDs for problems don't that yeah. don't exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist. So, real thing. Uh, so how 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 concerned are you about this and and how inspired are you by the reaction to it? Uh, so look, this is this is the big lie. This is what the big lie was, right? This is what Donald Trump started with. Oh, if we have vote by mail. Uh, it's going to be a rigged election. There's no evidence of that. There have been states that have been doing vote by mail for a long time. A lot of those states had those rules put in by Republicans. When Republicans were voting by mail, nobody had a problem with it. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, black people started voting by mail, and now it must all be fraudulent. So it is based, yeah. A, in racism, number one. B is based in falsehood. There's just... No, I, if somebody can actually we keep hearing there are affidavits and there are these and there's examples, but none of them were proved in court. Everything that Rudy Giuliani and Sydney, whatever her name was, took to court was <laughs> thrown out. The last one was thrown out in 80 cases or something. They got three instances of relief, which was not you're right. It was the OK, we're going to put a hold on this until something happens. Or we're going to send it to another court. That's it. They lost 80 cases on this. There's no voter fraud in America that is in any way meaningful, except in this state where I am in Pennsylvania, where the lieutenant governor has now found four cases of Trump voters voting twice. So just get off of it. It's not a thing. It, it, we are a democracy. We have been struggling since 1776 to get everybody to vote. We didn't do this right in the beginning. We didn't let black people vote. We didn't let men who didn't own land vote. And we certainly didn't let women vote. And then after suffrage, we fought about ways in which we stopped people from voting. And we thought we put an end to that in the 60s, but we didn't. This is the basis of democracy, and this is the big lie that is threatening democracy. So here's what I am. I'm inspired by the people, by the way, mostly women and mostly women of color who have been at the forefront of this fight, like Stacey Abrams and others. But I'm very worried that the rest of us understand that this is the big challenge. This is the thing. People didn't get their head around gerrymandering for a long time, and that was very influential. This is way more influential than gerrymandering. They are literally finding ways to take voting away. Why shorten the, uh, the length of the voting day in Iowa? Why take away Sunday voting in Georgia when it caused so many people to vote? Win elections on ideas. Don't win election on stopping people from the other party from voting. That is a basic thing for democracy that is threatened right now. And I do want everybody to understand they need to deal with this now on a state level with their local officials, because this could get very ugly. I like that uh, organization or that campaign that you retweeted the pledge at the pledge, which is uh, a commitment that court to make uh, corporations, companies and businesses uh, yes. support democracy. And some are still some major corporations in this country are still not pledging to not give money to a bunch of people who voted against the certification of the election or who are supporting yep. these voter. It's, it's as bad. It's yep. as bad to be to have voted against the certification of the election to in Georgia. Note to all you major corporations that are in Georgia. Delta. And there are a few. Tell. Yeah. Tell. Don't fund people who are voting to take the rights away of those people who are your passengers, who are your flight attendants and who are your pilots. I didn't say the company's name, but you did. So last question. Well, I just want to say you 
are so good at talking about anything right off the cuff and you can reference economic policies and history of really off your fingertips. But somehow in your brain that is a huge hard drive, you let the last name of Trump's lawyer escape you her first name as you mentioned now i got a towel you oh (laughs) man i was really gonna drag that out and make you guess that you is yes sydney powell lastly that lady something man that uh, that lady amazes me i mean rudy giuliani half of my brain is occupied by the fact that he was an interesting (laughs) and relatively effective mayor of new york during 9 11 and then he ran for president so like half of my brain thinks rudy giuliani is sort of normalish and then the other half is what happened to rudy Giuliani in the last few years i never knew sydney powell before this i've only known her as this weird conspiracy theorist who apparently has a law degree, which is fascinating to me. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we can talk, we can unpack what happened to Rudy, but um, finally I have not uh, seen you in a long time. You haven't seen probably a lot of people in a long time, although you have been traveling a lot and, and, and doing a lot more work. I think you're an essential um, a worker as a matter of fact, but the last question here is a fun question. It's a personal question. I wouldn't ask most people this, but you and I go very far back. And so I don't think it's inappropriate. I see you, you look great. What do you smell like? What is your body wash? This is really an interesting question. I have, um, I'm a cologne aficionado. I really like nice smells. You always smell good in studio. And and just before we went into uh, work from home, Mm -hmm. we have a, the the guy who handles bookings for all of uh, MSNBC. He's our senior guy. You might know him, Jesse Rodriguez. Um, Jesse smells like a million bucks. Oh yeah. And, and I went up to Jesse one day and I'm glad I did this. This might've been at the end of 2019 or beginning of 2020. I said, dude, you smell like a million bucks. What are you wearing? And, and I didn't get a straight answer from him. And then one day he shows up with this bottle of cologne and he gives it to me and I loved it. I smell like Jesse all the time. Uh, so, so I smell like Jesse Rodriguez. That's number one. Number two is the thing that has made me make working from home feel important. Like going into work every day is I, Every working day, I put that cologne on. So on days that are my days off, which are typically Mondays and Tuesdays, I don't. I wear a different, like my weekend cologne. And then on work days, I wear uh, my. You do uh, wear another Jesse scent Rodriguez. though on the weekend. Yes, I wear a different scent on the weekends um, as I do. From okay, work. Just, I, I, and I, I wear a different scent for evenings out as well. Is that right? Do you know you don't want to name? We don't any have of any them? evenings out, so that doesn't get <laughs> used much. You don't want to plug any of them. You don't want to name any of them on the record because. I feel we need to stretch this one out a little more. So okay, I know that fine. I'll get invited back to your show. Finally, um, I just know I, I dropped the Jesse Rodriguez hit. Yeah, so that's you good. can, you that's can, good. You can I'll ask him, him on. Yeah, we'll put that up on social media, make a thing of it. But um, you, I just realized this, you host the last word uh, every Friday, Friday night. Yes. I did not know yeah. that you did it every Friday. I know that you're always yeah. all over the place. Um, and, but so a lot of uh, your, your listeners, your fans, your supporters, those of us who love watching you, we, we're very, how do you host that show at 10 PM on Friday night? And then host your show at 8 a.m. Yeah, ne- can you tell us some you- bad negotiation? Yeah, what happens there uh, for you physically? Do you Friday stay- nights are very hard? Do you sleep uh, under your desk? And a lot yeah, of yeah, people- no. Well, I mean that's the one part about work from home that's better, right? Because I it, I, I never oh, right, lived as you know. I live close to studio, so it was only right. ever a fifteen minute uh, commute. But now it's a zero minute commute, which is very helpful. But yeah, Friday, you know, I'm pumped for that show uh, as always. Like when you're doing a show, you get pumped for it, sure. and I can't just fall asleep after that. Yeah. So I finish at eleven o'clock on. Friday night and my team is up and working by 4 a.m. on Saturday mornings. Uh, fortunately, as we discussed, they're such a good team that they they don't need stuff from me. But yeah, Friday, Saturday mornings are, let me tell you, it, it takes a lot Saturday mornings. Well, we're very happy that you're losing so much sleep because we get we benefit from uh, your wisdom and your your show on Saturday morning. So I don't actually care that much about it. I just like that you show up. Thanks, buddy. I, I do love it. I will say I, I, I will complain about sleep, but I'm not a good sleeper. So I'll complain about sleep anytime. I love my work and I love talking to you about it and about anything. Thank you very much for joining me, as always. All right, my brother. There he goes. Ali Velshi at Ali Velshi. I really hope that you enjoyed that. I think he is so good at talking about things and get so much information in even on a, a, a conversation and a podcast or radio where you don't have to worry as much about ratings and advertisements that you have to take breaks for. He's just real good at putting it all in there from economics to foreign policy. Doesn't make all his analysis always accurate. Always happy to hear him on a panel with other people and uh, providing nuance and arguments with each other. But I love his point of view on so many things and really is 
a great show. Go say hello to him on Twitter and thank him for joining me here on Stand Up at Ali Velshi. Okay, now joining me, my second awesome guest for today's show is an old friend of mine who I met also on the cable news panel rounds. She, however, has a lot more credibility than me. She is a political scientist. She's a PhD, as a matter of fact, at Fordham University in New York City, where she also writes a column at Amsterdam News about New York related things and is great at talking about New York City, New York State related stuff, as she does on the podcast FAQNYC, where she's a co host. Also, she co hosts the What's For Us podcast. She's editor at large for OZ and the author of a great book called uh, um, Black Ethics, Ethics, and she's working on a new book that we talk a little bit about during this conversation as well. Dr. Christina Greer at DR underscore CM Greer on Twitter. And we begin our conversation. We uh, hooked up on Zoom a couple days ago talking about this pumpkin that she has sitting in the bookcase behind her, this little pumpkin, which seems like it was just picked. Here we go. Dr. Christina Greer. In October and bought me a pumpkin. And this thing is like... That's a real pumpkin? It's a real pumpkin. And, and it has still... A... Oh, that's bizarre. I'm like, what demon, you know, nuclear pumpkin did you give me? <laughs> it... Maybe it's Nothing. not real, Chrissy. Maybe no, that's it's not real. a real pumpkin. It's real. You can like, you can see it. You can smell it just a little bit. It's totally real. She like got it from like a little, you know, pumpkin patch place in philly and i'm like mom what the fuck is this wow it's more- well you like- know what no no gourds do stay for for a long time right like that's why you people yeah, usually decorate it's sir a, it's, a go- <laughs> it's october it's oh. this is from she well, brought it in the beginning of october but you've kept it in a temperature controlled room i'm just making shit okay. up <laughs> i mean listen i have i live in I Brooklyn, acted like so I like about the everyone biology. teases me i have like project heat my windows are wide open they say wide open 365 days out of the year project heat by the way is in reference to the radiators in uh in certain buildings and what i know it as what i just learned is that they had these radiators that heated up so much because of the pandemic of 1918 and yes. they knew ventilation worked, so people would in the winter have their windows open and then the radiators would compensate for that is something yes. like that something like that it was a whole thing of like it it is for a reason but the problem is you know i need to get some copper pots to put on my radiators so that i can keep moisture in the oh, house smart. and like you know yeah. my mom always had like potpourri and you know things like that but like it is so dry and i'm like why is my skin so dry it's like because you have these piping hot radiators where you're sleeping in a tank top and short and it's like six inches of snow coming down every hour. And so here we are. My plants are like, <gasps> I wake up in the middle of the night gasping. Like I haven't had a nosebleed yet this season. Thank goodness. But like it's coming. I didn't so know yeah, you did. Basically, I didn't know you did impressions. That was an impressive <laughs> Plant. Well, you know what? Listen, I always tell people, give me two glasses of wine. My Charlie Wrangle impression is the greatest. Well, let's, he was on our. He yeah, was on my podcast. Right. I wanted to ask you about him. He yeah. was on uh, FAQ NYC, your podcast. Oh, and and, and as much as you so can much. talk about national issues, you're one of the go to people to talk about New York State and New York City politics. Column yeah. at the Amsterdam News, I want to reference to about women. But uh, Charlie Wrangle, wow, you oh. sat down with him. Um, well, first of all, before you tell me. You know what you learn. Apparently, I, I just saw it on Twitter as I'm preparing to talk to you, and I really want to listen to it. So I don't know what you guys talked about. But before you tell me what you talked about, what 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 kind of what, what do you think of him? Wasn't he kind of like a, a, a pretty uh, scandalous guy involved with a lot of corruption I mean, and stuff? Listen, in a in a 50 year career, sure you're gonna have one or two little ups and downs. All right, fine. He's 90 years old, like known as one of the smartest politicians. Sure. Period. Sure. Not like in New York, not black politicians, just one of the smartest politicians, one of the most savvy. Like, he knows how to get things done. You know, he took out Adam Clayton Powell, who at the time, you know, was going through his own stuff. But like Adam Clayton Powell started off as like one of the most powerful black politicians in Harlem, in New York state. And Charlie Wrangle's part of the gang of four. So that's like David Dinkins, Charlie Wrangle, Basil Patterson, who's the father of David Patterson, who was the lieutenant governor oh, who ultimately became wow, our governor. Okay, yeah. And then Percy Sutton, uh, who was more of like a, he was a Manhattan borough president, but, and ran for mayor, didn't win, David Dinkins won ultimately, but like, he was kind of like the quiet hand behind 
a lot of politics in New York City and New York State for many, many years. And I would say served as a foundation for Black politics in New York. Hmm. And also was like an entrepreneur and things like that. So like Charlie Rangel was the baby of the gang. of So Percy Sutton passes, uh, Basil Patterson passes, David Dinkins, as you know, just recently passed in October of 2020. And then Charlie Rangel is now 90 uh, and sort of reflecting on his life. And so we we interviewed for FAQ NYC, Harry Siegel, my co-host and I interviewed David Dinkins like two years ago. And, you know, Again, he was 91 at the time. So it was like, what is a podcast? Like, who are you? All? Yeah, he knows who we are, but it's like, <laughs> wait, you want to talk to me? But like, where's it going? There are no cameras. And it's like, no, it's like people can stream it. Like, it's, you know, you're explaining what a podcast sure. is. It's the craziest thing to someone who's like, I've been doing media my whole professional life. But what is this thing? Right. So David Dinkins lets us come to his office and just, and he's got pictures everywhere. So we're like, I was like, wait, what's that picture of you with Arthur yeah, Ashe? Tell yeah. me about that. You know, because David Dinkins famously brought the U.S. Open to New York, got criticized for it. It's like, oh, it's a vanity project because you like tennis. The U.S. Open, the two weeks of the U.S. Open brings in more money than the Knicks, the Nets, the Mets, the Yankees, right? the Rangers all put together. Wow. Right. So anywho, I realized Charlie Rangel is the baby. He's the last one of the gang of four. And I was just like, let's talk to him about whatever he wants to talk about. Right. You know, yes, there was like a scandal about some tax stuff with the DR and, you know, he got censured. But I was like, that's kind of well documented. I'd rather kind of talk to him about he was in Korea. Like he's in the Korean War. You know, David Dinkins was in the tail end of World War Two and never saw action. But like Charlie Rangel was in the war, came back and like, you know, hadn't even finished high school at the time. And so tells the story about kind of a run in with like a racist white cop. I was like, you know what? I'm not delivering boxes for the rest. We're not doing that. He, I didn't realize he was an AUSA, like an assistant U.S. attorney. Hmm. So like in the U.S. attorney's office, in a time where, you know, Bobby Kennedy nominated him, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was like the head of, he was the U.S. attorney of the Southern District. That's like when they were like notoriously like whites only. So I was like, how did you get that job? You know, like he's spilling the tea on Shirley Chisholm's husband. I mean, just... We were like, what? I mean, he really? said some on, the, on the podcast, he was really spilling tea. I mean, hot, blazing, scalding. So, what hot do you think tea. that's about? Just not, just doesn't care. Like, people are gone, doesn't care anymore, wants to be interesting. Did that? I, <laughs> well, I can't very wait to lucid, listen. Don't get me wrong. I yeah. mean, but he's still 90. I think there might also be this thing where, like, there's an assumption that, like, everybody knows this. So, like, I'm not spilling the beans, but it's right. like, no, like, Maybe at the time everybody knew it, but like you're basically the only person left who was there at the time. <laughs> so I'm writing this book on, you know, Barbara Jordan and Fannie Lou Hamer and Stacey Abrams. So I was like, what was Barbara Jordan like? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I love Barbara. And I'm like, oh, that's great. What? That's like, great. She, she was elected in 1972. He was elected in 1970 and stayed until 2016. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's certainly a fascinating <laughs> life. A lot to mine there. Did you? Are you going to use any of what he told you for your book? Mm. I mean, we didn't go into detail. Detail. He was just talking about her eloquence, which mm. is very well documented. Um, we, I, I spoke to his his kind of like coordinator handler person, um, and I was like, we just want to have another one, another like. Sorry to be greedy, but like he mentioned his grandpa in Virginia a few times. Um, and so I was like, I want to know a little bit more about kind of this grandpa Virginia stuff, like segregated Virginia. He would go there in the summertime. Like he's such an interesting bridge. I mean, if my parents are 73 and they both went to segregated schools and like their America is very different than the one that I grew up in in like private schools as like one of the few black kids, Dave or uh, Charlie Rangel at 90 saw a totally different America. He saw like many different Americas, like many different Harlem. Somebody should do a podcast just interviewing the oldest and still lucid black people they can find. Yeah. Just well, old you know what I realized? black people, the podcast, because I mean, everybody's got so much interesting, so many interesting things to say. A, maybe they never have, have told them because nobody ever asked. And B, yeah. just hearing them now in 2021 with this kind of new civil rights movement, it just it's a it would be an interesting perspective and an important one. Well, I mean, I interviewed my dad this summer when I was living with him in Delaware, you know, when COVID was like rampant in New York and I escaped for six weeks. I remember you telling and, me about um, that. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's when I was birding and all the good stuff. Where did you publish um, that? Did you publish it? Yeah, in Living Bird magazine. I'll send you the link. Your interview with him? No, 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 not my interview with my dad. My sort of reflection on birding and race and oh. city life. And <laughs> I, never saw, I never saw that either. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Living and, Bird magazine is like the hot, you know, premiere. I didn't know magazine. you were that big of a deal. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know, know you, that here's a, here's a crazy thing. nature stuff. I mean, I knew that I that we had this mutual passion and really addiction to nature, but... And that's good. But I didn't know that you were also writing about it. Well, here's, I hadn't planned on it. But the, the issue is this. Now that we're conducting these interviews from our home, mm-hmm. every time I'm on MSNBC, I get at least five, you know, emails every single hit asking me about this bird picture that is oh, behind me. great. And so great. everyone's like, oh, that woodpecker. You know, some people know that it's a golden fronted. Some people call it a, a, a red, you know, breasted. And you depending on if people can see it or how, how deep of birders they are. And then some people are like, Hey, by any chance are you a birder? And so then the head of the Cornell or ornithology lab was like, we have this magazine. Would you like to sort of Holy write about sh- wow. birding? And I was like, and I wrote him an email back and I was like, listen, I just started birding this summer at my dad's place in Dover, Delaware. Like this is, I- I'm new to it. It's I've just found it relaxing and peaceful. Like yeah. that's, that's kind of my extent. And he's like, that's exactly the article we want because so many people are like you. I'm trapped in sort of my little house area. I don't really go out much. My backyard is now all of a sudden. Right, right, right. Oh, that's great. I, I, can't, like, oh. I can't wait to read that. That sounds really it interesting. Resonated, it like, resonated with a lot of people. It's so also why article. I keep a water bong in the frame of my shot. So people viewing <laughs> send me so we know. Just let me know. <laughs> we'll talk about is something offline about that. Is that a water bong in your shot? Right. You sure got a bird. Well, I, I just saw something on like Instagram or something where I guess someone was doing like a bong hit and like didn't have her camera off. So someone was like, uh, hey, that's girl, awesome. we all just saw you take a bong hit. That's okay. awesome. <laughs> so I'm writing an article now for Living Bird. Um, I interviewed a guy um, and his name's Scott uh, Webster. Scott, oh, no, Scott. Wal- oh, I'm blanking on his last name. Um, who's a professor at Harvard who biked cross country. Scott Edwards. He bikes cross country. Uh, he's head of like a bio lab at, at Harvard, but um, he had like um, like a, a bird sign and a Black Lives Matter sign. And he started off in Massachusetts and drove and biked across to Oregon. And like, I'm talking to him about Talk his about reflection. intersectionality. Yeah. So I'm talking to him about like race and politics because yeah. it was this summer. So I'm like in the middle of an election season, you've got Black Lives Matter signs. You're a black man on a bicycle and you have like, you know, nature sort of mm-hmm. saves us. Birds matter. Sign. You know, it makes me th- I mean, I it, that scandal or, or controversy over the summer or was when whenever it was when the black guy in Center Park was his Christian name. Cooper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's a birder and he's black. And this woman basically calls the police. I mean, people are probably familiar with what happened. But in a weird kind of way, it also was like black people are birders and or yes. or can be or, you know, there's these weird sometimes things that come out of of, of things that get a lot of attention. Yes. Maybe good good things. I don't know what I'm trying to what am I trying to say about this so, guy be, being profiled as a birder? Yes. What I what the takeaway for a lot of people from that situation is this. So Christian Scott, who's a pretty famous birder in the birding community. Oh, yeah. Was in Central Park birding, uh, and a woman, um, Sarah Cooper, I think her name is. So he's Christian Cooper, she's Sarah Cooper. No relation, but Crazy. it's interesting. Hilarious. I think that they have the same last name because sure. there is a relation, right? It's like sort of even the last names sort of en- encapsulate the complexity of American identity, where it's like this black names man has paper. this white woman's yep. last name, yep, right? Yep. Um, she is in the wrong in the sense that her dog is off leash. We have very strict leash, no leash rules in New York when your dog has to be in a leash, not on a leash. He asks her to put the dog on the leash. She does not want to. She then calls the police on him and is sort of holding her dog in a way where the dog is yelping and she's escalating the situation to make it such that I'm, I'm fearful and you know, I'm afraid that this man's going to attack me when he's the one who's saying, ma'am, I'm fearful. Please put your bird on your dog on a leash. So it it ends up being a thing. You know, she ends up like, I think the dog was taken out of her custody for a while. She lost her job. And so Christian Cooper is like, I think what's happened to her is more than enough. Like she shouldn't be punished more. And other people are like, no, she actually could have gotten you killed if she wanted to. Like if the cops came, like trust and believe you could have gotten killed in the middle of the day in Central Park for birding. So it brings, it brought up this larger question of, a, 
there's a large community of black birders because that was a conversation. Uh, there's Black Birders Week, which started, which is a pretty um, growing, robust uh, sort of a movement of black birders. Yeah, because, you know, some of us are in cities, some of us are in rural communities, some people are in the South. But here's but here's also the thing, because so many black birders have had negative interactions with white people in nature. It brings up these larger questions of you're looking at something that is so free and so pure and like it fills your heart with like, wow, look at them just soaring, riding the wind. And it's like, and I can't be free in this country. Right. right? I can't be free in my black skin. And while I'm even looking at this bird, imagining what freedom looks like, some rando white person is like, you don't belong here. I feel threatened. I thought your binoculars were a gun. And so that's why I've called the police. So like black birders have these larger um, conversations about like, well, we can't go birding too early in the morning because we're going to scare white women, right? We can't go birding too late at night because we're yeah. robbing something, right? We can't be too in the brush, you know, trying to to look at specific birds because it's like, what's this black person doing creeping around? I'm calling the police. So it's like, this is supposed to be just nature. Like we're all supposed to be equal and free in nature, frolicking, looking at beautiful things. And there go the whites. <laughs> like, what is going on? Did you say there go the whites? <laughs> There's like, that's kind of the question of, you know, black birders are like, oh, well, and so the thing is, though, but it is a community. Right. So, like, I told you my my like bestie in the birding world is some like 70 something year old white man from Tennessee. Right. I've never met him like he and I brought him up in the story. I know him from Twitter. I like retweet his pictures. We've started talking. I included him in my living bird article. But like when the pandemic hit. I mean, he's and I've bought his coffee table book for myself and like for several others. He self publishes it. So you have to like order one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I helped him like pick out the birds for his calendar that he sends wow. to family members. But like when the pandemic happened, he DM'd me and he was like, Chrissy, I know you're incredibly busy. Like, I don't even know if he knows that I'm on TV. Like, I think my bio says that I'm a professor. So like he knows that. But like he was just like, if you don't mind, my wife and I are very worried about you. We know that you live in New York. Like we hear these numbers of New Yorkers spiking. Can you please just check in and let us know? They like packed up and like went on an RV with the grandkids, like driving cross country birding. And he's like, and he also lives, you know, in Tennessee someplace, but he's like, please just check in on me. Cause you know, I want to make sure that you're safe. So like I have this family in Tennessee yeah. <laughs> of some random Twitter friend, white man. <laughs> I, I don't know his politics. I don't know anything sort of, you know, about him, about him. I just know that we both love birds. Well, I have some bad news for you. He's actually at the insurrection has been arrested. Right. And, right. Uh, his I, mean, I, I think about that all the time. Like, what if I find out that he's like a, a wild Trump? <laughs> I, I don't well, know. I know. I think we all have that concern uh, about people when we get to know him, especially and like them. Wait, wait a second. But right. let me, you know, that's, but it's also a tribute to you. I mean, I think that one of the, the most interesting things about the pandemic is to see how relationships w have developed in all of our lives. And yeah. my relationship with you has developed far more extensively yeah. than pre. And also I've learned a lot from you, I think, as, as, as to how to carry myself as a person and treating other people and thinking and being curious. And I'm sure that's the effect that you had on on with this guy. And you've always paid forward what, what you've learned. And I wanted to ask you about your column uh, regarding this. This is, again, why I think your personality is so infectious and likable and why everybody wants to talk. <laughs> I'm an acquired taste, trust and believe. Well, I haven't <laughs> seen that yet. I haven't seen your, your weaknesses. I look forward to uh, finding the warts. <laughs> but but I mean, you write at Amsterdam News in your column about um, the, in, a, in a column titled Happy Women's History Month, which we're in right now. You say there are so many women who have inspired us in our personal and professional journeys. For Women's History Month, I ask that we make a list of the women in our lives who have influenced us to be better versions of ourselves. Many women on your list may never make it into the history books, but they have quietly helped lift up an entire community. They don't have fancy degrees or have to be philanthropists, but they have contributed to our lives and likely the lives of so many men and women in large and small ways. I loved it. And I started making a list. I was so Yay. glad that I read this. I started making a list and I, I wanted to know if you could just share one or two uh, women uh, who have influenced you in your life. Yeah, on I mean, your list. Well, you know, besides my mom, who, you know, I mentioned, We've but like, it's sure, funny yeah. my sister read that article and she's like, um, excuse me, ma'am, where the hell am I? <laughs> and my sister's two and a half years older than I am. She, I mean, I would probably argue is like my beacon. She is my North Star. Yeah. I think that she's like the most 
beautiful person inside and out. I think mm. she's the smartest person I know. Like in my family, we joke around that I'm the white sheep. So like, you know, in, in your family, like the person who's who's messing up would be called wait, the black sheep. Wait, so black like in my family, families say white sheep? Yeah, Is that so what you're saying? Like you're the white sheep of the family. <laughs> I've never heard that. I was a Come mess. on. Is that a black thing or a Greer thing? I don't know if it's, I think it's a black thing. Have your Come black on. listeners write in. <laughs> tell me. I'm white sheep. But like, Go in ahead. The, like growing up, the running joke was that I was the white sheep. You know, when my sister was at Harvard, I was visiting her so much. I was like damn near flunking out of high school because mm. I was hanging out at Harvard so much. Like, and she's like pre-med. She graduated like with honors in biology from Harvard. So even her friends from Harvard were like, yeah, we went to Harvard, but like your sister like really went to Harvard. Like she actually like really took class. Right. <laughs> like, so she's, you know, just so wonderful. And the fact that, you know, I, I was not interested in having kids. Um, I just, I think that I just wasn't, but like she gave me two nieces, right? Like, which I think is the most important job ever. Like, I think being, uh, I call myself a pank, a professional aunt, no kids. Right. Um, and so, like, I'm that aunt where it's just like, hey, you know what? Because I had an aunt like that. I mean, she was married to my dad's brother and I have cousins from from that side of the, the family. They're the Chicago careers. But, like, everyone needs an aunt where it's just like, the answer is always yes. So it's like, let's do frivolous stuff. Yep. Like, when Gabby and I went to Europe for two weeks, like, we were just balling out. <laughs> like, I was like... I'm going to introduce you to European shopping. This is what it is. Like the answer is yes. There's, you should always have that person in your life where it's like, let's do it. You know, your, your parents are the ones who like, you know, have the foundation. I'm for like all the frivolous nonsense. Yep. yep. They can be so, more, much more of a friend than a parental figure yeah. uh, an aunt or an uncle. And yeah. So my sister, and you can punch like out anytime you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, I'm I'm there and then I'm like I'm checking out yep. <laughs> I go to visit because they're like what you know their their whole thing is why aren't you here for the pandemic like you can do everything in Philadelphia move into our home I'm like no first of all I would go insane right like I find their house to be much louder than I'm accustomed to like I'm not used to living with four people like this is too much like it's just too too much i'm like everything makes noise in this house including the people so i was like no 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 my visits are enough um but so my sister i would say is obviously number one through one thousand now give me but a non-family I'm, member talk to me um, well, because sister. i'm writing this book about barbara jordan fanny lou hamer and stacy abrams you know i spent a lot of time thinking about the three of them and like thinking about how the three of them are connected as like black american women from the U.S. South, you know, my mom's from the South. My dad's from the South. I was I've only visited the South, you know, several times a year growing up. But I'm not a Southerner. I'm straight up Northeastern girl. But there's a level of respect I have for the South and for Southerners, especially black people from the South, because there's like so much rich history there. I mean, there's like so much of like my identity is literally in the soil and on, you know, in the trees and in the air and the birds, like everything about for me, my black identity starts in the South. So like to write this book deliberately about black American women, you know, not Kamala, not Shirley Chisholm. Like that's the book that a lot of people are writing, like from Shirley Chisholm to Kamala Harris, you know, Shirley Chisholm ran for the presidency in 72 um, to Kamala Harris becoming vice president. Right. So like, you know, that's a circle and a cycle. But like, you know, they're they're both children of immigrants, which I think is really important. But that's not the identity of like 90 percent of black Americans in the country. So I really wanted to kind of tap into this like black American female leadership in a way. And I'm just so inspired by like the fact that Barbara Jordan, Fran Lou Hamer and Stacey Abrams are all known for their like eloquence and oratory skills and their intellect and like strategy, like how they were able to maneuver in this kind of like white supremacist, anti-black space in the 60s, in the 70s, and then in the 2000s. So the answer is Barbara Jordan and someone, you know, these women that you're writing about have been influences that you're grateful for on your list for March. Yeah. And yeah. yet you so so the list requirements, it doesn't require you have met the people. 
No, no. That's what I thought. I put on a prerequisite that I, I knew them personally. Now my list will broaden. Yeah, I mean, your list. I'm putting you on my s- list now. Yes, thank you. Well, I think it's great to start with. Actually, I just scratched you, know. you off. <laughs> it's like, I don't like her. But <laughs> I think it's great to start with people you know and then broaden out. So, like from micro to macro, or okay. start with macro and then come into micro. You well, know, like, think of, I think of it this way. Like, I think about the lunch ladies that I have always had. You know, I've, I've gone to private schools my whole life, <laughs> I've worked in private schools my whole life. And by and large, the lunch ladies have been, you know, black women. Um, and all the institutions that I've been a part of. And like, there is something to be said about a lunch lady when you are a black child in a white institution. Like the lunch ladies look out for you. They sort of give you encouragement. They sort of tell you the things that your your teachers and your professors don't tell you, you know, in the sense it's like, you're great. Like you're kicking butt. You're beautiful, whatever it is. And it's like to have that throughout the day as a reinforcement, to have someone that you know is sort of like, you know, looking out for you as a parental figure or whatever it may be. It's a it's a type of relationship that many people haven't written about. But like there's not a single black professional, I would argue, who understands that they're black and like appreciates that they're black that doesn't have some or hasn't had some sort of relationship with either a maintenance person at their white institution, whether it's their job or their school or a lunch lady. Period. Dot in. Uh, so many things. It's so, that's fascinating. I would never have thought, uh, imagine that. And then that's, you know, talking, if you have the trust and, 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 and can have a, uh, such a, an honest conversation with, with people of color who are as, I think, observative, observational, observative, uh, yeah, and intelligent as, words. yep, love <laughs> it. Then, then it's great because you get to hear these types of insights that you would never you would never have thought of even the most curious of the whites wouldn't have thought of <laughs> the other whites <laughs> really because you just don't i would never have i would never have, have, have thought of that that's a great great answer so let me yeah. just pivot out of that though and and talk to you just about you know you're writing this book about fanny lou barbara Jer- jordan stacy abrams and it seems that the you know the one thing that connects all of them obviously is is, is voting civil rights and and, and voting mm-hmm. Are you what is your emotional reaction to the fact that there are so many new laws on the books making voting harder for likely Democrats, especially black folks? What is what is your emotional reaction? And then we can talk about what needs to be done about it. Right. I mean, I'm utterly not surprised (laughs) Um, because, I mean, the Republicans have painted themselves in this corner where it's like they can only win by cheating. And the franchise has been something that has been dangled in front of black people, you know, ever since the the 14th and 15th amendments. Uh, and it's ebbed and flowed and it's been given and taken away. And we've been gerrymandered racially and politically partisan wise. And so now the demographics have shifted in such a way. It's like, we know, we kn- we knew that after 2020 and looking at the electoral success of organizing black people, especially to others across not just the U.S. South, but across the country, despite all of the laws and draconian measures that were put in to sort of keep black people out of the political process, because that's like your own political destiny, right? Like if I can decide what my leadership looks like, you know, if I can mobilize people and have collective action and I can change what this democracy looks like for me, right? That's a very powerful position, especially when you see that black people tend to overperform percentage wise when compared to other racial and ethnic groups. So we knew a backlash was coming. I mean, that's the nature of American politics is always a pendulum swing. It ebbs and flows. And but so but what, I'm hearing, and what I'm hearing you're saying, you're saying honestly is that that black folks in America certainly are conditioned to when you see progress, grassroots organizing to to win in elections like in places like uh, Georgia, led by high profile, in this case, black women. What it sounds like you're saying is black people when they see that actual progress, we'll also say to each other, watch out now. We know for a fact. I mean, like everyone duck. I don't think we'd be surprised that like from Barack Obama, you get Donald Trump. From David Dinkins, you get Rudy Giuliani. Mm. Right. From Harold Washington, you get one of the dailies. Like, really? Right. So it's like, we've seen this. This isn't new. Like we know that there is a swift pendulum swing and that machete is is sharp well it's most and obvious also, in politicians but, but in policy too yes and in elections, policy, but policy too. to undo 
what has what progress has been made. But I think here's like the the crux of, of what it is to be black in this country. Black people understand white people better than white people. Because we sure. have to understand yeah. you. If not, we don't survive. Yep. Let alone yep. thrive. But right. like we don't get to live. So we understand the capacity because you know, we've heard stories, right? Or people who are older have seen stories. Like we know this is why January 6th surprised and no black people. <laughs> It's like, we know that white people will kill white people to maintain white power. Like, especially the whites that work with people of color. Like, we've seen it. <laughs> we've seen, you know, when white people were organizing in the South just for voting rights or justice. It's like, oh, white people will kill white people just as quickly as they'll kill black people if they see them as, like, traitors, right? So January 6th, it's like, yeah, they would have killed Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi. They would have ripped her limb to limb. And so the thing is, I think white folks don't fully understand that. And we're like, we keep trying to tell y'all. We keep trying to tell you what white supremacy looks like. And so that's why also when people are like, Joe Biden, how did he become the nominee? It's like, because black people don't get to always vote for their first choice. He wasn't the first choice for a lot of people. But James Clyburn explained to black people, like, listen, ain't no white people voting for Bernie Sanders. So like, right. Go for your second choice so you can at least get something as opposed to nothing. So like we are the strategic voters because we understand white people. Yeah. Period. The dynamic that you just explained has played out uh, throughout history that black folks clearly understand and that white folks don't. And and, and, and we're trying to understand it. And those of us who just heard you should (laughs) confront that. But that can all be demonstrated in one video. When I uh, forget his uh, his name, the officer, the, the black Capitol Hill officer goes running by Mitt Romney and doesn't stop. And Mitt Romney's like, what's what's happening? What's happening? Right. And that can right. that's symbolic of everything that you're yeah. saying, because if you see a black guy running, you don't ask. Just trust him. Run yes. with him. Well, you know, you're <laughs> because your the white people Cedric are the entertainer. Well, white, white people are going to rip Romney limb from limb, too, yeah. if he doesn't follow Right. That office, right. police officer, honestly. Well, you're, and that's, um, he, oh, I'm blanking on his name, Eugene something. He got um, the Medal of Honor. Um, oh, I'll look it up. Yeah, go ahead. I, I want to get it right. Yeah. So, but I'm thinking of uh, your colleague, uh, colleague, Cedric the Entertainer, Eugene Goodman, that's his name. Um, Cedric the Entertainer is a bit from um, Kings of Comedy, where he's talking about, like, if you see a black person running, like we are conditioned, we are trained. Do not like, hey, Pete, what's going? It's like, no, start running. Just take off with Cedric and start running. And so he has this whole sketch where it's just yeah. like, he's like, I bet you if I started running right now, everybody in this arena would just get up and run. And it's like, yes, yes, we would. It's like, we don't need to. We will ask questions when we are down the block, <laughs> safe. Like, hey, why are we running? And sometimes it might be like, oh, I don't know. I saw you running, so I started running. It's like, wait, I saw you running, so I started running. But it's like, let's not stop and ask. And I think the reason why Eugene Goodman has like received all these honors is because he's like, I know that I'm the bait. I know that I actually might get killed. I know that these people are out for blood. And like, they would like nothing more than to kill this black police officer. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, very few of them have had any repercussions thus far. Like the woman who was like, I have a trip to Mexico. So she gets to get out of jail. Mr. Shaman and his vegan food. Right. I mean, like all these folks who are just like, oh, I didn't mean it. I mean, I, you know, like this, this kind of white innocence that is taken as a given and white and black sort of deviance and white and innocence uh, is uh, taken as a given. Be, is best, just best, phenomenal. Sim, uh, most symbolically explained with with the following phrase. Wait, I can't I can't be in here. Right. right. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't realize it. I didn't. I'm sorry. But but here's the thing with like Dave Chappelle, you know, he's kind of scared about, you know, everybody, every black person needs like a white, like a down white friend, which is so hilarious because Dave Chappelle sort of talks about things that black people talk about just in regular conversation. But like when they're, you know, smoking weed and speeding and like doing all types of legal activity and the cops pull them over and, and the white guy is like, I didn't know we weren't allowed to do this. And the cop's like, no, you're not. But go ahead. Like, go on your way. <laughs> Dave Chappelle's like, wait, what? Yeah. It's like, yeah, dude. Like, just say it. Sorry, I, I sure know. didn't know that was the law. Yeah. See you later. Thumbs up. Yep. Let's keep it rolling. Oh, yeah. So, Absolutely. I mean, like, and the thing is, we laugh about these things because if not, we'll go insane. Well, yeah. And, and it's also the, 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 the humor around it uh, points to the truth around it as well. Yeah. I mean, there, there's been... That's, that's that, why comedians, that's why I love comedians, yeah, because yeah. you all are such like a finger on the pulse of like what is going on and like what's important, you know, and like you highlight it and make us laugh about it. 
which is so necessary is, you know, I told you one of the first times on this podcast, like there's a reason why when I was a classics minor and we're reading about, you know, so the Greeks and leadership and democracy and all this other stuff, it's like comedians are in every single Sophocles, you know, Aeschylus, Homer, like you all have a place in society. There are people who've always been in society, right? Like these like tech gurus, they weren't in society, but like you've always had lawyers, you've always had doctors, right? You've always had teachers slash professors, and you've always had comedians. Every single set of literature, whether you're reading African plays, right? Whether you're reading, you know, Greek tragedies from hundreds of years ago, comedians are part of the foundation and a structure of society to help us learn and make sense of the world. Yep. So I, I think we're in this moment where I'm just so interested in what comedians have to say because you all are like processing. Well, but you, you know, all but, get to process at the same time as us, but like you're faster than us. But that uh, let's give a little less credit to comedians now, especially because comedy can be found anywhere from TikTok to Twitter. There's a lot of very, very, very funny people who are far funnier yeah, than comedians and they're on Twitter and they're ma- and, and they're doing what you're saying yeah. satire is there for. So I'm just yes. pulling credit away from the actual the stand ups to the, the people who are just brilliantly funny um, yeah. and, uh, you know, on social media or anywhere else, because it's 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 obviously important. It points out truths and hypocrisies and speaks truth to power. Often, not always. There's some great com- like Instagram, TikTok comedians out for there. sure. Like, I mean, there's there's some black women that I've started to follow, like one black woman who's young. I mean, it's interesting, but she basically is like the equivalent of she says things that like your black mom or grandmother has said. Huh? And she just makes these like, send them all to me. I want to talk to them. That's awesome. And it's, I mean, when I say it's hilarious, it's hilarious because, you know, black people, at least my black friends and I talk about this all the time. How is it that we had the same exact upbringing and there was no internet, there was no social media. So how did our mothers say the same exact phrases? How are we sort of like rewarded and punished in the same exact ways? Like why, why was the behavior identical? So like, you're from rural Texas. I'm from New York City. You're from L.A. You're from Miami. Like, how are how is like our mom going to say goodbye to someone? And it takes an hour and a half. And like how is she this, this comedian has this one sketch of like how black women are basically slowly but surely leaving someone's house. And the kids are like sitting in the car for an hour and a half. Like, oh, my God. And then like you have the nerve to sort of like have a quick attitude. It's like, what? Are, like, let me talk to you. Like, I'm still. So it's like the one leg in the car, the sort of now, you know, huh. we're in the car with the, the engine on and the window down. We've also now we put the car in reverse. They're still talking. And like every single friend of mine that I sent it to, that was our entire childhood. Hmm. Like you've got to get ready, get in the car. We're leaving. But then our moms get to talk for like an hour and a half. <laughs> it's like, what? So I think that there's this, especially in isolation with COVID, comedians are doing such a great service, professional or Non-professional. Yeah, comedy it's is. Like yep. you're link. I mean, I think, but that's the role of the comedian, like to link everyone with this like shared collective experience. Or if it's not your experience, to expose new people to an experience For that sure. like you didn't know existed. For I sure. mean, so yeah. you know, I've I always mean, said as you guys a, are like as a the white, funny educators. As a white male audience member, I watching a female comedian, a gay comedian, a black comedian. I learn a lot about that yeah. experience traveling through life and, in, in, you know, in our culture and society in, in this time. Like, wow, I never would I never would have thought about that. And right. it's, it's it's very educational and helpful. All right. I've taken um, okay. more of your time. Oh, yeah, than I I asked for. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I know how busy you are. I love to talking you. to you. And uh, let's talk again as soon as you're possibly available. Yes, I'm around. Just clicking clacking with these keys. <laughs> And there she goes, Dr. Christina Greer. Love talking to her. Love talking about the nature issue with black folks and all of that. I want to dig deeper into that. There's a a lot of very interesting literature and work on that history and so much more. So, And there's also great initiatives, like I mentioned, Children in Nature Network, uh, whose work I try to plug anytime I possibly can. Great organization to support and go say hello to Chrissy on Twitter at dr underscore cm Greer on Twitter. Give her a follow and thank her for joining me as well as Ali Velshi at Ali Velshi and thank you all. I hope to see you tonight at our hangout. That is at 8 p.m. East. If you're a subscriber, if you're not, what are you doing? I mean, seriously. 
sign up right now. It's like five bucks or twenty five bucks, whatever you want, whatever you want to pay. Some of people, some people pay a hundred bucks. They do to subscribe to this podcast to support me building a daily show right here in the shed every day. And we're all gonna party pretty soon. I mean, when this shit is over and it's almost over, we're going to somebody's house. I'm going to do some regional ones. I think I'll do a Northeast party, maybe a Southeast party, maybe a, a, a Mid-America party, maybe a West Coast party. Let's do some parties, some stand-up community parties. Who's in? Who is in? Let's keep it train moving along. I love it. Thank you guys very much. I hope to see you tonight, and I will talk to you tomorrow. And you can always join us on the Discord platform if you're a stand-up community member as well. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or the paid subscription link in any day's show notes and sign up there. And I'll uh, talk to you on Discord as well, which is just a platform to text and chat, and it's great. All right, that's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Take it away, John Carroll. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans for the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one can try. Rise up, show a to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up Did you know that at the end of the song, every show, I put something here? Just some kind of a message or a, an old recording of mine or something? Well, I do. And today, I didn't know what to put. I didn't have any ideas. And it's one thirty-seven in the morning. And I don't, I don't have any gas left in the engine. In the old... In the old uh, Carburetor. Is that where gas goes? I don't know. So I figured I would just ramble for as long as I could to see who is listening. <laughs> now, I got to put it to bed. I thank you very much for uh, coming all the way to the end here and for listening to this because you have your AirPods in and your phone is uh, 12 feet away and there's nothing you can do about it. But you're still hearing my voice. And I'm sorry that I didn't give you anything to stay for today. But thank you very much for listening. I love you. And if you're here, I would give you a hug. I would ask you if I could first. I'd say, can I give you a hug? And then you'd probably be like, yeah. And we would hug. I'd give you like a couple of those back slaps. Probably.
that guys do. Ah, it's good. You know, it's still a manly hug type of a thing. All right. Good night.